have been here the whole time. Some of you have taken the opportunity to travel and do some fun things during summer. Welcome back to Pam. Welcome back to Voices and Praise, or as I like to call them, our blue shirt mafia. <laughs> is there any truth to the rumor that the first thing in the audition process is you have to, like, you're evaluated how you look in light blue? Yeah, yeah. That's good. Uh-huh, right. Singing, yeah, it's all about how you look in light blue, so that's good. And choir is back next week. Our Sunday school, our children's ministry programs started back this week, so it's, uh, it's a kind of a fun time of year. Climatologically, we're a long way from uh, fall, right? <laughs> like summer, we're just, summer's just getting started, but um, programmatically, we are kicking off our fall ministry season. So, and so we're doing that uh, after church this morning with a kind of a potluck cookout. There's some food there that we're providing. There's some food that y'all have brought. So there's going to be a great opportunity to be able to enjoy that food, enjoy the time of friendship and fellowship. There is a bounce house and some water and all that good stuff. So it'll be a great opportunity for us to stick around, to have some fun, um, and to celebrate as a congregation kind of the beginning of our programmatic year. Uh, let's see. There really only a f- one other announcement that I wanted to make before we have the opportunity to um, celebrate as a congregation and welcome a new member. But Ruth Alice Wallen. Ruth, can you wave to us? You're going to wave. There you are. You, Ruth, is, this is a special day in her life tomorrow. She is going to be turning 94 years old tomorrow. So, so congratulations on that, Ruth Alice. We pray God's blessings upon you. Uh, 94 years young, so that's great. Um, And so for us as a congregation, we have a very special opportunity this morning. We get to welcome somebody new into our membership. I would invite Dorothy Miller to come forward. I'd also invite Pat Eslanis to come forward as clerk of session. She has some things to share with you all and some questions. Dorothy is joining uh, Gardens Presbyterian Church this morning as an affiliate member. Affiliate members uh, are something that, it's a membership that is kind of fun for us here in the Presbyterian Church. It allows people who are seasonal or who have homes in different places, in Dorothy's case, Jamaica, which is not a bad place to, to uh, reside most permanently. Um, it's an opportunity for uh, folks to kind of retain membership in their home congregations, but then also to affiliate with gardens. And so Dorothy is primarily in Jamaica most of the time, but when she's here, she is uh, loves to be a part of this congregation. She's active in this, and so we're really thrilled to be able to honor you and to welcome you into the affiliate membership program and so that you know that this church is as much as your home as your congregation in Jamaica is, and um, you're just a really important part of this congregation. So, And when you're here, you bless us with your presence, so we're happy to, to do that. So I'll turn it over to Pat Islam. On behalf of the session, I present Dorothy Miller, who has been received as an affiliate member of this congregation through reaffirmation of faith. I have a couple questions for you. Actually, three. The first is trusting in the gracious mercy of God. Do you turn from the ways of sin, renounce evil and its power in this world? If so, I do. I do. Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior, trusting in his grace and love? If so, I do. And will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? And do you declare your intention to participate when you're here actively and responsibly in the mission of Gardens Presbyterian Church? If so, I will. I will. Great. Uh, And just an opportunity for you to maybe introduce yourself. I I did a little bit of one and just maybe share with the congregation why you're excited about having a chance to do this. If you feel so Thank you so much, Pastor Kyle. I... I think most people here know that I have been worshiping here for a while. I enjoy worship. I, as a matter of fact, I was started coming when Pastor Bush was the minister, and I found him such a great teacher. And Pastor Kyle is just following in his footsteps. A wonderful young man who is filled with the grace of God. I consider it a pleasure. I am a wife of almost 50 years, and a grandmother of five. My daughter and her family live in Jupiter, and my husband and I, we are dual citizens of both Jamaica and the US. So it's, it's my great pleasure. I find this church warm and welcoming. I've never ever felt not welcomed here. And 
I praise God that he has allowed Pastor Kyle to just, you know, say to me, would you like to become an affiliate member? And so it makes me feel even more at home. So thank you very much for being so kind and warm to me. And I just pray that God will help me to continue to serve him in the best way I can. Thank you. God bless you. I'm going to say a prayer over Dorothy, and then we'll continue with our service. Let's pray. Holy God, we praise you for calling us to be a servant people and for gathering us into the body of Jesus Christ. We thank you for choosing to add to our number brothers and sisters in faith. Together, may we live in your spirit and so love one another that we may have the mind of Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom we give honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. I would invite the congregation to stand and to greet one another, welcome each other to worship, and come forward and welcome Dorothy to our membership. Our scripture lesson for this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 13, verses 10 through 17. Hear now the word of the Lord. Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And a woman was there who had been disabled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over, couldn't stand, and couldn't stand up straight. And when he saw her, Jesus called her to him and said, Woman, you are set free from your sickness. And he placed his hands on her and she straightened up at once and praised God. The synagogue leader, incensed that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, responded, there are six days during which work is permitted. Come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath day. And the Lord replied, hypocrites, don't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey from its stall and lead it out to get a drink? Then isn't it necessary that this woman, a daughter of Abraham, bound by Satan for 18 long years, be set free from her bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said these things, all his opponents were put to shame. But all those in the crowd rejoiced at the extraordinary things that Jesus was doing. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we invite your Spirit's presence to fill this sanctuary. Fill our hearts. To be present in this place with great power. And so now... We take a moment simply just to recognize that you're here. Lord, in this time of worship, in this time of reflection on your word, we open up ourselves to you. We consent to your divine action and presence within. And Jesus, I pray that you would have mercy on me, a sinner. Christ, in your name we pray. Amen. So Luke tells a story of a community of faith gathered for worship and for teaching on the Sabbath. Again, given the cultural and the religious context, this is a Jewish community of faith. Their Sabbath is on the Saturday and they gather in a synagogue, in an unknown, or unnamed at least in this particular gospel account, an unnamed town somewhere in between the northern region of the Sea of Galilee and Jerusalem. Because in this particular section of the Gospel of Luke, we know that this is kind of the great pilgrimage 
where Jesus and his disciples are moving from the Sea of Galilee in the northern region, especially of Capernaum, where he had his, his base of ministry for the majority of his years in ministry. And they're moving now, they're taking a pilgrimage down to Jerusalem. So somewhere on that journey, they stop at a town and they go to worship God in a synagogue. The synagogues are different than temples. It's not a place in which the sacrifices were offered. It wasn't a place where there was a professionalized clergy. There were no Levites. There were no priests. No people wearing fancy robes or stoles or anything like that. The synagogues were a place where the town, the community, the people of faith would come together and they would be led by lay leaders people from within their community. And so as Luke is telling this account, we can imagine that the synagogue is full, similar to ours, that there are people, men, women, and children, there are young, and there are the elderly who are all gathered together to be instructed in the Torah, to be instructed in the ways of how to live according to God's covenant promises that God made with Abraham. Of all those people who Luke allows to be unnamed in this particular account, in this particular story, there are two people that Luke draws our attention to. One is a woman who has been disabled for 18 years. She was literally bent Low, bent over from the affliction of pain and also the affliction of suffering. But you can also imagine that the pain and the suffering were not the only thing that bent her low. But that there would have been despair or questions, maybe even hopelessness, as she entered the synagogue to worship God. 18 years of suffering, 18 years of praying for healing, 18 years of calling out for God's assistance and God's mercy and God's power and those Cries, those prayers seemingly unanswered. 18 years of questions. She was weighed down by the depth of her physical suffering, emotional suffering, spiritual suffering, but she was there. Humbled, full of faith and expectation full of obedience, coming to honor God and to be strengthened in her life of faith. And then Luke tells us that there was another there, the synagogue leader. Again, somebody from amongst the community, a lay leader, somebody who would have been put in that position because of his, sorry ladies, his, cultural, socioeconomic, familial power and prestige, probably as well of some devotion, religious and spiritual devotion, strong faith, you know, a religious leader from within their community. I mean, if the woman who came in, unnamed, came in with Doubts and questions. If the woman who came into the sanctuary came in bent over and bent low from the weight of the world and the weight of her suffering, and the synagogue leader, he stood before the people of God erect and proud, confident, Not full of questions, not full of doubt, but full of answers, full of certainty, full of
full of knowledge or his perception of those things. He was sure. He knew about God. Knew what God wanted. Knew what he would tell his gathered congregation what it was that God wanted from them. There was no mystery, no doubt, no questions. He had it all figured out. And so in this synagogue, Jesus' attention is immediately drawn to the woman who enters. 18 years of suffering. And in one of only four occurrences in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus heals this woman unsolicited. Four times only does that occur in the Gospel of Luke, where Jesus offers healing without first having that person request or inquire or ask about healing. Jesus seems to be drawn to this woman because of the weight of her suffering. Jesus seems to be experiencing such a deep kind of pathos or emotional response of empathy for this one who has suffered for 18 long years. And out of Jesus' love, out of Jesus' mercy, out of Jesus' kindness and goodness, out of all that is right and all that represents the reign of God within Jesus, Jesus reaches out. He extends to this woman and he offers to set her free. Doesn't even offer to set her free, just does it. Just heals her. Takes away all of her pain, all of her doubt and question, all of her suffering. And it is replaced with joy and with lightness. She was bent over and now she stands up. She was limping and now she dances and she praises God. This woman who had been a part of this synagogue for years, for 18 years, had been such a part of the community that her disability and her suffering and her pain would have at this point gone unnoticed or unrecognized, forgotten. She was forgotten, but not by Jesus, who reached out to her with love and with grace and with mercy and with power and tenderness and healed her and set her free. And she danced. But that synagogue leader, instead of giving thanks to God, instead of rejoicing, instead of dancing himself, instead of instructing the people of God to rejoice and to dance with her, instead of instructing the synagogue goers to recognize that in Jesus, the one who was present within them, there was power. There was unique authority. There was something there. God had visited them in some way. Instead of celebrating, instead of being joyful, Luke tells us that the synagogue leader was incensed. What was wrong with him? How can you witness a miraculous outpouring of God's power and God's love and God's mercy and God's kindness and God's healing and God's goodness. How can you witness that in a place of worship at a time when the people of God have gathered for worship? How can you be incensed by that? It was because in his religious quest, in his practice of spiritual leadership and spirituality, he actually forgot about God. He replaced 
God. With himself. He struck such a posture that he was the religious authority and the expert on the scriptures and on interpreting those scriptures that he and he alone could speak with authority about what was right and what was good and about what God wanted and would want for people and for within the community. And he, of course, knowing the Old Testament, knowing the Decalogue and the Ten Commandments, as well as the book of the law, knows that there's a command for the Sabbath. Everybody who goes to church, who went to synagogue, knew this. God called, God commanded, God demanded that the people of God practice Sabbath, practice a Sabbath rest, where the people of God would not do any work. And this was a clear violation in the synagogue ruler's mind, a clear violation of the laws of God. I mean, come on, people, it's obvious. Why would God want anyone healed on the Sabbath. It's just ridiculous. Because healing is clearly an act of work. But the synagogue leader, obviously, Jesus, speaks to this point. Just didn't get it. Didn't understand why the scriptures were written. Didn't understand why God gave the people the laws that are recorded in those first five books of the Old Testament. Why we ourselves have the entirety of the scriptures, the Old Testament, the New Testament. Not so that we could whip it out like an owner's manual when our appliances break. And figure out what exactly to do in every situation so that we would live without uncertainty or live without doubt or even live without mystery. But so that we would be given a living and breathing and spirit inspired collection of reflections and words about who God is, and about how God loves, and about how God calls the people of God to live in community and to love one another. And that's, that's the important thing, to love one another. How could anyone open up the scriptures and find justification to deny love, to deny healing, to deny mercy for someone who was suffering. Jesus couldn't believe that interpretation of the scriptures and was not bashful in using strong language to correct the synagogue leader's misinterpretation of the scriptures. And then offering Jesus' own reinterpretation, fulfillment of the scriptures. That God is love, that Christ has come to offer that love and to offer that power and to offer that healing. And that anyone who would deny love or mercy or healing Anybody who would deny wholeness or healing or compassion in the name of God was outside of God's will and outside of fair interpretations of the scriptures. But, I mean, the synagogue leader, it's, though he's incensed, it's not as if, at least in his mind, he's being unreasonable. What does he say to the woman, actually, not to Jesus himself? He faults the woman for showing up on a Sunday or a Saturday, on a Sabbath. 
saying, listen, if you wanted to be healed by Jesus, which she didn't, right? She didn't have any intention of being healed by Jesus. Scriptures are very clear. She doesn't re request or inquire about that healing. There's, no, in, there's nothing that Luke conveys that gives us a sense that her desire was to encounter Jesus or to experience healing, but yet the synagogue leader still criticizes, criticizes her for showing up on the Sabbath and kind of expecting and demanding to be healed. And he says, listen, if you wanted to be healed, if you wanted to be healed by Jesus, like all you had to do was show up tomorrow. I mean, then everyone could be happy. Then God could be loved. Jesus could be powerful. And my interpretations of the scriptures could be upheld. And everybody would be happy. Right? It's almost, it's almost ludicrous. And yet, we do this kind of stuff all the time. We, we use our own faith. We use our own kind of theology. We use our own interpretation of the scriptures. We use kind of our own religious practice to exclude people from God all the time. To deny people Christ's loving power and Christ's healing. And we do it in the name of religion. And we do it in the name of spirituality. Faithful purity. And Jesus' words to us when we find ourselves doing that are the same words that he would have spoken to the synagogue leader which is that we are being hypocrites if we ever create barriers between someone who is suffering and God's love God's power. Because Christ has come to knock down every man-made, artificial, pretend religious and pretend spiritual barrier that the community of faith, be it Israel, be it the church, has built up to prevent people from experiencing God's powerful restoration in their life. And Jesus has come to remind us that we, you and I, are called to be people, that we are called to be a church that radically includes, that radically loves, that radically blesses, that generously heals And that generously allows and extends and creates time and space and a relationship for those who are desperate and for those who are suffering to come and to experience God. And let's pray. Jesus, we pray that through the power of your Holy Spirit, you would give us both the grace and the courage to recognize the synagogue leader within us. And we pray for your power and your love and your grace to encounter us and to meet us when, like the woman, we are weighed down and full of suffering. 
Christ, in your name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand now and to join in singing.